This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, a part of the IDN SEPA scholarship program and uh, having the students meet with President Carter to get some feedback on their research is always a highlight of the program in so many ways. I want to just say a few words about the IDN SEPA scholarship. We've been doing this for the last five years. Uh, it has students to do study abroad and, and learn about the developing world. Um, students uh, apply, they write a research proposal, they get some feedback on that research proposal. Of course, they're working with their faculty advisors all along the way. Um, and they keep in touch with us a lot of the time when they're away and when they come back, they have the opportunity to share the results of their research with President Carter and get some feedback. Um, I'm, uh, we've been very pleased to work with uh, SIPA, uh, the Center for International Programs Ab Abroad, and I'm just going to ask Christy to say just a brief word and then we'll get started. Yes, my name's Christy Hubbard, and I'm the director of the Center for International Programs Abroad. Um, I know Philip Wainwright's uh, name is in the, the program, but I'm on behalf of him today. And I would just like to um, thank uh, Dr. Rashad Nielsen and the IDN for providing this wonderful opportunity for the students. And again, I would like to uh, thank President Carter for personally supporting the program with his presence today and, and taking an interest in the students' projects. Um, this program really has, a, has had a profound effect on the lives of Emory students, and I'd like to share a quote um, from a previous participant. Uh, the IDN SEPA research was a great complement to my collegiate experience. It reaffirmed my interests in public health and nutrition and allowed me to have practical experience with proposal writing and research completion. This scholarship enabled me to collect the research for my honors thesis, which then helped me get my job after school. So I'm sure we will soon learn how these students today are um, having, have had enriching and life-changing experiences on the program that will contribute to their scholarship here at Emory and their personal development. And to the students, I would just like to say that while today is certainly a um, high point in this program, we hope that it's not going to be the only highlight stemming from this experience. And we're looking forward to hearing how you're going to use the knowledge and skills that you obtained um, in moving forward with your academic career here at Emory and in your future career path after graduation. We'll begin, President Carter, the same way we did it last time, and ask the students to give um, very brief summaries of their research findings. And then, would you like to respond to them individually, okay. and we'll have some conversation at the end? I think it would be better to do it one at a time rather than wait till everything goes Okay, over. that works. All right. It's better well, for me, anyway. <laughs> all good things begin on the left. Fine. There you go. Well, let me say let me say a word first of all, if this is permissible. Well, I'm very uh, pleased with this program. On the way back from Africa, uh, President uh, Jim Wagner and I had a discussion about how uh, students at Emory could have more of, a, I'd say, a, a productive relationship with some of the third world countries, some of the developing nations. And it's customary in, uh, in most universities for students who go abroad to go to Paris or to go to London or, or maybe to go to Beijing if they want to study Chinese, or to go to Tokyo if they want to study uh, Japanese. But uh, we thought it would be good for, to, for some of the students to have a chance to go into the third world countries where challenges are much greater. And I have to uh, admit that the cost of the programs are much greater. It costs more to go to Rwanda or to Vietnam or to Mongolia than it does to go to Paris and back. But I think the uh, in-depth study that uh, I've experienced in the past has been very intriguing. And I, all, I think also helpful. I noticed in the comment by a previous student that it led to their, to their completion of a graduate degree and also to a job, which is one of the nice things to look at. But I think it also gives you a chance to get to know people that you wouldn't know otherwise. And uh, I've met with the, I think the 2007 group, there were seven of those. And in the 2010 group, I think there were 14 of those. And I look forward to hearing from you today. So uh, after each one of you gives a presentation, I'll reserve the right to ask a few questions or maybe just a comment. So thank you very much. I've read I've brief summaries of your, of your reports, and I'm in, intrigued with all of them. So I don't know what order you'll go in, but it's... Can I have to use this? <laughs> Hi, my name is Bethany Harrington, um, and I studied abroad in northern Uganda. I was based in Gulu. Um, and so just a little bit about northern Uganda. The region experienced a 22-plus year armed conflict, 
And um, I originally was going to study the role of formal education as a part of their peace building and um, their community building process. But once I got there, I felt like that topic, which is listed here, I felt like it was somewhat divorced from the reality of what people were living and what they were experiencing. Um, and so I was sitting in a coffee shop with some of my friends one morning and they were sharing with me just how they were processing the pain of what they were experiencing, the hard stories, the trauma, um, the lack of government support for this region. And it hit me, it's like, I would love to figure out what my peers are experiencing and how they're processing their time here. And so I ended up researching how the other students on my program um, processed and made sense of the post-conflict situation of Northern, of Northern Uganda. Um, and so I guess what I found, well, in my questions, I was really trying to understand, you know, what have you found that is beautiful about this place? What have you found that's broken? What are you having a hard time understanding? How do you feel being an American student in this context? And um, what does that look like for you? And the biggest findings that I had, one was um, it was really hard for us as American students to understand how um, a government can completely not support its people. Um, Northern Uganda has experienced or felt a lot of oppression from their government. And so it was really hard for us coming from you know, America where we, on the most, for the most part, we are supported by our government to see just how devastated the region is and how there's not much funding or support to help. Um, it's severely underdeveloped compared to the rest of the country. And um, that was just really challenging for us. But on the other side, what was found to be one of the really beautiful and hopeful things about Northern Uganda um, was just how resilient and hopeful and how, how much faith the Acholi people have in the region. And um, even though every day seems to be challenging and with new with new problems and complications, even though there's still so much trauma, so many orphans, um, there's just this sense that things are going to get better. Um, and so that was something that we, that I found them to have, to feel as students. Um, and so I guess to close, um, I, something that I was talking to my Ugandan advisor about this, you know, we have, we've been here for only three and a half months, this is what we've learned, this is what we've seen, and it's only a snapshot of this region. We, and it, it's really hard and really frustrating. We come here and we care a lot, but we can't make a lot of sense out of what happened here. And so it was 12 students, three months, and the picture that we got was a small one. And um, I'm interested to see what Northern Uganda looks like in five, 10, 15 years. You say you were there for three and a half months? Mm -hmm. uh, how many of you ever ever heard of Joseph Kony? Well, that's where Joseph Kony used to attack in North Uganda. And by the way, uh, Andy Young's daughter was in Angulu for a number of months, I think two or three years, as a matter of fact, on a health mission earlier on. So that's a very interesting part of Uganda. As, as you know, as you may know, uh, this is uh, very true that this is a, a region that feels that it's neglected by the central government. The Carter Center has had two major programs in the northern part of Uganda. One is to eradicate guinea worms, and they will never have another guinea worm case in Uganda, they had about 136,000 cases to begin with. And we've just shifted a, a major emphasis to eradicate uh, river blindness, to eliminate it for, for that region. We've already been successful in two other parts of Uganda, uh, to, this, to the west and to the, and to the south. And we've done away with, uh, with river blindness there. And now we're shifting our attention to uh, eliminate uh, river blindness in that same region. But so your uh, comments were very helpful to me. The people though still feel that the government doesn't give them adequate attention, is that right? Mm -hmm. that, that's a shame. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, Joseph Kony has been away from that region for more than five years. He shifted his attention to the Central African Republic and also to the, uh, to the uh, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. So he's out of that region. Although the, the recent movie about him right. was on YouTube, uh, they had him pictured as still attacking the children in, uh, in North Uganda. Did you enjoy living there while you were there? I love living there. Um, the people are so warm yeah. and so receptive, um, so helpful. Um, it was beautiful every day. It would be hot, but it's yeah. easier yeah. than summers in Georgia. So. And what portion of the people could speak some English? Um, most people in the town center could speak English. From the villages, not yeah. very many. Not very much. I understand. Did you learn any of the native language? I did. I learned quite a bit. Actually, it just in conversation, it's very simple, or in some ways it's simple, and so it was easy to pick up. That's good to know. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a very intriguing report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and who comes next? I don't know what the order will be. Are you next?
Um, my name is Lexi Merrick, and I spent the semester in Rabat in Morocco. Um, and so for my project, I've, in the US, I'm a human rights activist, and I was yeah. really interested in how human rights organizations operated in Morocco. Um, and so for my project, I research international and local organizations and how they interact and cooperate with each other. Um, and so for, I came up with sort of two different conclusions, and those were that, um, that most of the partnerships are funded, are driven by funding, and furthermore, that, that funding affects the activities of the organizations. And second, that the, um, that the partnerships build social capital. And so for, in order to conduct my research, I looked at three different organizations of different types. And the first type was um, a local organization that was based in Rabat and had partnerships with uh, international organizations outside of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was on DAOSH, or the Moroccan Association of Human Rights. And then the second, orga the second organization I looked at was a, um, an international, larger international organization with an independent branch in Morocco, and that was Amnesty International. And then the last um, organization I looked at was the National Democratic Institute, which is a US-based organization that has a field office in Morocco that's closely affiliated, and they're their activities are directed by the US, by the office in Washington. Um, and so through these, uh, I did interviews with members of the organizations and I uh, went to some of their events and I came to the conclusion that a lot of their partnerships are driven by funding. And this would mean that if you're a local organization, you're, gonna, you're going to direct your policies and design projects that are gonna attract the attention of the international community and their funding. Um, and if you're an international organization, you're going to look for organiza local organizations on the ground that align with your values and are going to be able to have the capacity to carry out their projects. Um, and so it was really interesting. And I also found that these partnerships build social capital and that there's this sort of international civil society network that's being created and the international community is becoming smaller and smaller. And um, the, it creates a flow of ideas and generates knowledge and makes connections between people that are, would have been impossible um, without <laughs> these partnerships. Mm -hmm. And so it really is, I think it's changing the way that human, act, human rights activism works in our world today. Um, and I've really been able, I've been excited to be able to see this, my research is really applicable and it's been able to come to life. I'm interning with the human rights program at the Carter Center this semester. And um, I've been able to really see a lot of aspects of the research apply there. Um, and I'm really, I hope I'm hopeful that I can uh, go back to Morocco and research these issues in other areas in the future. Uh, it's, it's a good place to go on vacation as yeah. well as the, uh, <laughs> my, my family has been there. Yeah. Uh, so in the past. Uh, and Amnesty International got some of that funding from local members of mm -hmm. Amnesty, right? Mm -hmm. But yes. NDI got their funding the, basically from the United States Congress. Yeah, it also comes from USAID and the U.S. government as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. You, you've noticed the problems that NDI has had in Egypt, have you not? Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that uh, NDI was present there also during the, I think, peaceful and maybe successful, uh, you know, Arab awakening mm -hmm. in Morocco where the king was a little bit more accommodating mm -hmm. to, to encourage changes. D did you see any indication there that, that NDI encouraged uh, potential opposition to the king? Um, I did. I, I, when I spoke with them, they had been working mostly with civil society organizations. While I was there, um, they had their first elections after the new constitution, yeah. which was instituted, instituted in July. Yeah. Um, and so in November, they had the first elections as a part of that, and they were seen as sort of a democratic transition. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of nervousness around the elections, but they were their success. And um, NDI did a lot of funding for civil society organizations that were monitoring the, the elections, mm -hmm. and they helped to build their capacity. Um, one example is that they looked at a um, an orga local organization wanted to do media monitoring, and so they brought in an expert to help them yeah. learn how to do that. So I definitely think that they supported those efforts. Yeah. Uh, I've known the present king of uh, Morocco since mm -hmm. he was a child. <laughs> uh, his, father brought him, <laughs> his father brought him to the White House oh. to meet us, and, and Amy, my, my daughter, was, was uh, just uh, a young girl. She was nine years old. So we taught her very carefully, you know, to, to address the senior son as your royal highness and so <laughs> forth. And so when they met, she, the first thing Amy said was, hi, Prince. Good to have you here. 
<laughs> and, and, and his father, the present former king, was a very good friend of my mother. <laughs> oh. And so she visited Morocco earlier. But Morocco is a beautiful and very it's intriguing beautiful. country. It's interesting to note that in the so-called Arab Spring, the uprisings, the uh, monarchies have survived mm -hmm. completely and haven't yeah. been even threatened with any overthrow. But that's because I think the young kings in both Morocco and Jordan have tried to accommodate the citizens yeah. by giving voluntary changes mm -hmm. that gives them a little more democracy than, uh, than the most uh, r radical members mm -hmm. uh, get, won't, won't, but, but, but not quite as much as some won't. But I think they have survived because the young kings have been more accommodating. They're able to adapt. Well, that's a very interesting thing. And, and how uh, non-governmental organizations can cooperate with uh, each other under limited funding yeah. is also helpful. Uh, the Carter Center has the same problem in having <laughs> to orient our effectiveness with how much funding we can receive. And we also appeal to donors. And so does the IDN program, by the way. Uh, I would like to see maybe 30 or 40 instead of <laughs> just seven here someday. Maybe we can get some funding to send more and more young people over, overseas. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, you all not only derive a lot of benefit yourselves, but, but the impact here in, on the Emory campus is very important, but also the impact that you have in meeting with the people in those countries are, is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Thank that you. report. Hello, Pres President Carter. Um, my name is Gabriel. I did my research in Rwanda. Um, yes. When I had ri or my original proposal to IDN had been to study the relationship between happiness and tolerance, um, particularly in the post-conflict situation. But I ran into a problem in that no one could admit that they were intolerant or else they would go to jail. <laughs> um, and that kind of limited my ability to do that research. So I ended up um, actually leading, this led me into what I did study, which was, um, Rwandan perceptions of what is democracy. And the reason that, that this, this train kind of went is because th this anti-genocide ideology law is, by a lot of standards, undemocratic. It limits what people can say. It limits what people can talk about in the public space. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also acts as a means of the government to repress some opposition. Um, and this is, by Western standards, undemocratic. But in the context of Rwanda, I was wondering whether they considered this undemocratic and more largely what they considered to be democracy because Western, Western um, in influence on Rwanda has tried to foster a kind of, uh, has tried to foster democracy. Um, and Rwanda has had um, a mixed relationship. In the 1960s when there was the first rise of democracy, it led to um, massacres as the Hutu power movement um, began. Um, yes. And then in the early 1990s, when there was the second wave of dem uh, democratization, um, this was right when Rwanda experienced a genocide, and some scholars have, um, have found a correlation between these two events. Um, so then, so what I did is I found uh, about 10 uh, members of the Rwandan middle class. I didn't originally anticipate that I was going to limit myself to the Rwandan middle class, but I, I uh, used this group because they were, um, a, is more readily available for someone who only spoke English, but B, because mm -hmm. um, in the Arab Spring and in a lot of the literature, uh, going back all the way to Aristotle, one sees that the, the middle class is the driving force behind democratization. Um, and so I asked them questions about what they saw as democracy. And um, the, the thing that I expected, which was a huge emphasis on security, was there. Um, when I asked um, what rights they thought people had in a society, Eight of the ten of them, eight of ten of them, uh, immediately said security, but surprisingly, only two of them said that it trumped everything else. Um, mm. They actually put more of an emphasis on uh, freedom of expression and um, uh, the actually the two things that they emphasized the most was incorporation of multiple ideas in the government. Um, so not just so allowing for quota systems, which um, put women in power, allowing for um, multiple parties, forcing multiple parties to be represented in the government, um, was something that they were very much for and very, very active for. Uh, one woman told a story of how, um, because of the quotas for women, uh, w and women in the post-genocide situation were capable of getting um, water, water regulation better, uh, water provided to their communities, 
Um, they were able to get um, assistance from the government for uh, their, their families, which are now, because husbands are either killed or in prison, um, uh, get assistance for these, for these single mother households. So they emphasized this, and then they emphasized education, because they saw education as the cornerstone of having democracy. You can't have in, in their minds, in a lot of their minds, you couldn't have democracy unless you had a population who understood it and could be responsibly enact it. Um, so those were the the major findings that I found. Major findings that I found. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> and this impacted me. Um, this whole experience impacted me in an incredible way because the, this is a community of people who have been traumatized. Were the you, entire country. Were you aware when you were interviewing people of who was a Tutsi and who was a Hutu? Um, there, was, there were occasions where you could tell. Um, who were the ones you, you interviewed 10? Uh, what, were all of them Tutsis or what? There were the, the one, so you're not really supposed to ask people if they're Hutu or Tutsi. Yeah, that's so why I ask you. The, the <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, so the way one could figure this out is if before 1994 they were um, in a refugee camp outside of Rwanda, they were probably Tutsi. Mm -hmm. So okay. there were uh, four members of um, who were Tutsi, I could decipher were Tutsi by that standard. If they were in, in Rwanda or in opposition to the government, they were likely Hutu. Yeah. Um, so three of my participants, one which was my host father, um, <laughs> and one who was actually in exile uh, in Uganda, um, were uh, certainly Hutu. And, but apart from the last three, I couldn't tell you. Um, and they wouldn't tell me. That's <laughs> I didn't ask. That's but. interesting that they, I can see the sensitivity in not being self-identifiable. I'm, I'm a Tutsi mm -hmm. or I'm a Hutu. They don't want to say that. Uh, as, you, as you know, uh, the, I know the president of, uh, of uh, Rwanda. We, we've had programs for about five years on a very intense basis in that r lakes region. And um, He's been given great credit for some of the economic progress they've made, but been condemned by many democracies in the West as being very oppressive and not permitting any real political opposition. But, but your explanation is very intriguing and very rational because the people prefer to have strict uh, security mm. uh, among their people, not to have a, a, a repetition of what happened in 1994. And uh, so they'd rather have security and peace among them than to have genuine democracy. But they were unanimous in saying that education was, a, was the avenue to a yeah. better future, no matter whether the government is completely westernly democratic or not. Is that correct? Yeah, the, um, that is correct. And just, just to uh, go on that point, there were, it, you can make an, an analogy to yelling fire in a crowded room. Sure. You can't talk about genocide in Rwanda because things things could very easily spiral out of control. Well, the Western nations so. really made a horrible mistake in not moving in to prevent it or to correct it after it started because it, it lasted. But, but the United States, as you know, had suffered a real embarrassment in Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we were very reluctant to, to, to intercede. And of course, the French and the Belgians and others were guilty as well. But, but that's a, 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 one of the most traumatically affected countries on earth with what has happened in the, pa in the recent past, that is the last 20 years or, or less. That's a very intriguing thing. And, and do you enjoy staying there? Oh, I loved Did Rwanda. you feel safe and, and, and welcome? I felt safer walking around the streets of Kigali than I feel walking around Atlanta. Um, All right. <laughs> I understand. It's, uh, it was an amazing, amazing experience and yeah. the country is beautiful and the people, despite what they've been through, are incredibly welcoming and incredibly uh, generous. Mm -hmm. And you found it that the middle class with whom you dealt, a lot of them could speak English. Uh, yes, or they spoke um, French, and I, I had a you translator. Speak uh, oh, I, speak. I, I speak French, but I would also have. I, I speak French, but not well enough to be comfortable doing interviews without a translator. <laughs> <laughs> but did you, did you feel that all of those at whom you interviewed still were, were heavily aware of what happened in 1994? Everyone in Rwanda is shaped by what happened sure. in 1994. I, I can see why. Um, and Burundi would probably be the same. Yes, I can understand that. Thank you very much. Right. So, hello, my Hi. name is Alexandra Pill, and I did my research in Vietnam. Yes. Um, 
in, in, Hano in Hanoi? In Hanoi's okay. old quarter. Yeah. Um, so I chose to do my research on street food vendors, um, aside from being a foodie at heart, but also because I find street food vending incredibly fascinating because it incorporates economy and history and cultural studies and nutrition policy and food policy. And together, that conglomerate um, provided a really interesting avenue for me to explore. Um, in addition, street food vending in Hanoi's Old Quarter has this romanticized view, but also a deep history in what informal economy in Vietnam is. So through my research, I interviewed 10 street food vendors, um, a variety of either mobile vendors or stationary vendors. And complementing that, I interviewed six policymakers. Mm. So these were officials in government, um, researchers who did research on food safety, and as well as um, various policymakers uh, with regard to urban space policy and also street food safety policy. Um, so after interviewing them, I hoped to find different discrepancies and overlaps in which street food vendors understand what policies are available or what policies are implemented, what the implementation of those policies actually is, and then what policymakers think from their governmental positions. Um, and I found three major initiatives, one being a ban from 2008 on designated streets, and it hap so happens that a third of the streets in the old quarter are part of this ban. Mm. So it's a significant amount of streets. And that, those bans are just beginning to be implemented? They <clears throat> were technically implemented starting in 2008, although it's unclear the implementation and the consistency within that. So, But there were still street vendors on the banned streets, right? Yeah, I think two or three of the vendors that I interviewed were on a banned street That's and very thing. nervous during the interview. But <laughs> aside from that, they the, it was ri worth yeah. the risk. They, they didn't think you were a Vietnam official, I'm sure. No. <laughs> 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 Though they were very skeptical because they yeah. were very concerned that if yeah. I was a journalist, they didn't want to talk to me. I understand that. Um, yeah. So the second initiative was a food safety law that was implemented um, more recently than the ban. And that was to issue these certification cards for the vendors to ensure that they were providing safe s food for mm -hmm. the public. Sure. Um, but given that the majority of the vendors are mi urban mi or rural migrants or temporary migrants or don't really have a home base, it's really hard to track these vendors and to make sure that they have a health official that they can communicate with and it kind of spirals out in that way. Um, and then the third policy initiative I found was a proposal to localize vendors into vending centers in the city so that following more of a model that's in Malaysia or in Singapore. Um, but all in all, policymakers and street food vendors have very different views of what is actually occurring and what's being implemented and how it's implemented. Um, so that's discrepancies with enforcement, discrepancies within policy, and then also a lack of transparency. So I really, really enjoyed my research. Um, it was not only delicious, but <laughs> really, really um, an incredible experience. And I learned a lot. And I learned a lot about working with a government that doesn't share its policies with the public. I've been to Vietnam. I've met with the top leaders of Vietnam. We, we built Habitat for Humanity Homes in Vietnam a few years ago. And my wife and I were there with some volunteers. Did, did you? Uh, See, were the vendors not only selling food, but also handicrafts and, and, and other things from, from their own Yeah, world. vendors sell everything from t-shirts to trinkets to food and whatnot things. But, but, but I they're, focused not they're not inclined to, to gather in a particular souk or, or market. They, they're pretty well ubiquitous all over the old city. They, well, because I just focused on street food vendors selling food that they prepare Actually. on the spot. Um, I try to limit my definition because otherwise it can go many different directions. Yeah. Um, but for most of the food vendors, their biggest concern was they have customers that come to them every morning or every evening, depending on what type of food they sell. Yeah, sure. So they have people expecting them, and they have a steady income from those customers. Yeah. So 
they didn't want to move into a center where they had more competition oh, and um, so they their had customers had to local come to customers them. Who lived nearby. Mm -hmm. I understand. Oh, that's interesting. Did, did, did they consider themselves to be, would you say, fairly well off, middle class, since they own their own Not cars, at all. They consider themselves to be in a lower economic well, status? On one hand, they consider themselves well off because they have a means of producing some yeah. sort of income, that's whether it be temporary or not. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But on the other hand, a lot of them aren't well off. They're renting um, by the tile. And oh, really? they're living in cramped quarters with a bunch of other vendors, or they're in very destitute situations. Or some of them were retired, and that's what they chose to do. So there's a span of the population, but for the most part, they were from the lower classes. And, and most of the vendors with whom you communicate, did they live in the old city, or did they come in from nearby farms to uh, um, every day on a daily basis? I'd say it was half and half. Some that didn't live in Hanoi uh, lived maybe 200 kilometers out and would take the bus in every oh, really? morning. Hmm. Some would take the bus in on Monday, stay for the week, renting by the tile, and then go back to their rural areas for the weekend to see when their families. When you say by the tile, do you mean by a, a, something like a square foot and that sort of thing? Yeah, it's like a 14 by 14 tile. Typically, they rent four tiles per night. Oh, really? That's interesting enough. Well, thank you. In fact, the whole report was interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Carter. Um, my name is Perrin Savang, and I did my research in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Um, so for my project, I wanted to look at uh, non-government organizations in Mongolia and how they could effectively promote and address uh, concerns and issues of the LGBT community, LGBT community that exist in Mongolia. Um, and so for my project, I divided it into two different parts. Um, the first part, looked at sort of the general environment, uh, the general LGBT environment in Mongolia. So particularly, um, what were the issues, what were the struggles that LGBT people faced? Um, what were the general perceptions that non-LGBT people had um, uh, toward LGBT people in Mongolia? And also kind of where these types of discrimination stem from within Mongolian culture. Um, the second part of my research uh, looked into the response of these NGOs in, um, in sort of trying to address these specific issues and struggles. Um, and so what I found was that um, the LGBT environment is still relatively very hostile there. The, um, relatively what? Hostile. Hostile. Yeah, very hostile because... Um, government and other citizens as well? Um, yeah, the government's not very supportive and society is still kind of on the fence about, you know, how to treat LGBT people, yeah. so. Um, so what I found was that um, the, the movement itself, the, the queer movement itself is relatively new. Um, it came about in the late 1990s and so this discrimination um, manifests within uh, the Mongolian society in a lot of different ways. So not only do you have uh, direct physical abuse um, you also have verbal abuse, but uh, in general, there's this um, there's this silence towards discussing sexual uh, issues about sexuality, sexual identities, um, as well as um, uh, sexual behaviors. Um, and so, one what I wanted to look at was sort of um, you know where these types of discrimination were stemming from. And one of the things that you can kind of tell um, is this general lack of education among you know, children there. And this, this is largely a result of the um, socialist past of Mongolia. For most of the 20th century, um, Mongolia was a satellite of the Soviet Union. And so it had adopted a lot of the you know, moral policies, the legal policies that the Soviet Union also had. So, um, in terms of uh, sexuality, the Soviet Union um, made an effort to criminalize um, people who were deemed deviant, um, so people who practice non-normative sexual behaviors or who express non-normative genders, gender identities. Um, and so Mongolia kind of in their footsteps also adopted similar policies. 
Um, and so what you can see, especially among the older generation of Mongolians, is that um, they still have this mind, the, this mindset, this framework of you know, a criminalized um, type of sexuality. And so they don't want to teach their children this, and you can see this in schools, you can see this in the workplace. And so what a lot of the NGOs, uh, this leads me into the second part of my um, project, uh, is that the NGOs that I looked for or looked at were trying to promote the education, like promote education. Um, and so the different activities that they put on were that they would host workshops in different schools talking about sexual orientation, what that meant, um, different sexual activities, um, also um, protection, um, how to keep yourself safe during sex, so how to use condoms, things like that. Um, and these issues are very predominant uh, within the LGBT community themselves. And so by did, you know, talking about these issues. Did you interview any gays or lesbians in Mongolia? Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and is it, is there, are there any laws that tend to protect them, or are the laws uh, dis mm -hmm. distinctly condemning what they do? Right. Um, the actual law that um, criminalizes sodomy has actually been yeah. taken out. Um, however, there aren't any actual protections um, for LGBT people. Um, so, you know, if something happens and discrimination happens because of somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity, um, the police don't necess can't necessarily won't do anything about it or can't do anything about it. The NGOs that, that you dealt with, are they there to try to protect the rights of the, uh, of the sexual? Yeah, yeah, through their activities. Um, I interviewed four uh, non-government organizations. Three of them focused specifically on HIV, AIDS prevention and education, and then the last one focused specifically on promoting LGBT human rights. One other question, are, are those NGOs, are they domestic or are they, are they foreign? Uh, they're all domestic. All domestic mm -hmm. NGOs? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. You have another comment? Oh, uh, yeah. So just, just in conclusion. Um, I'm sorry I interrupted. Go oh, ahead. No, it's fine. Um, I'm not really sorry, but go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. No, just, just in conclusion, really, um, this, this project really benefited me because, you know, here in America, I'm really interested in sort of um, uh, how LGBT rights are fought for here and what what Americans think of that, and to kind of see it in a different cultural context and to see how um, Mongolians, um, you know, how culturally specific their discrimination is or how culturally specific they're trying to address these certain issues. Um, it was very, it was very fascinating and provided sort of a different perspective on um, how to view sort of the American way of thinking about that. So, very interesting. Yeah, Mongolia is one of the most rapidly changing countries on earth primarily because they've discovered great mineral wealth in the interior of Mongolia. I was in Mongolia. In fact, I got back from Mongolia the day before 9-11 uh, occurred in, uh, in the United States. We were there to deal with cashmere wool. But uh, they've discovered enormous uh, deposits of very precious metals in Mongolia, and, and the entire economy is now being totally transformed by the massive influx of foreigners who come in to extract those metals and minerals and to give enormous contributions to the economy. So it's a rapidly changing e economy. Uh, just to go off that a little bit, it's definitely globalizing. It's definitely trying to. When, when were you there, by the way? Uh, I was there in the fall. So from this past fall. This past well, fall so you saw yes, the sir. changes taking place. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, however, you know, it's also, there's a problem with, you know, extracting minerals because that's destroying the environment. So and they the are destroying. And there's a, right. a great struggle in Mongolia now to protect the environment and also to make sure that the wealth that's pouring in yeah. is equitably shared with the people of Mongolia. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. That's Thank a you. very intriguing report. Good afternoon, President Carter. Um, thank you guys all for being here. This is awesome to hear all of your projects, and it's wonderful to be here. So thank you to the IDEA and also for sponsoring this event. Um, my name is Joey Shea. Uh, I uh, am an IDS uh, scholar here in interdisciplinary studies. So I'm designing my own major at Emory, and I'm focusing on sociology and sustainability. And I had the opportunity to go to Costa Rica last fall. Um, see, it's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and study uh, the, the social impact of um, ecotourism, which I identified early on as 
um, an industry that kind of bills itself as a sustainable industry, and so that really piqued my interest. Um, and there's a critique of ecotourism that focuses on on the social side of it. Um, if you look at it from a triple bottom line perspective, um, the, the social aspects of it are what tend to be uh, often criticized as being unsustainable. And what I mean by that is oftentimes you'll have a situation where um, the financial benefits of ecotourism in a region are not staying with the local populations or the communities that are actually dealing with the environment, preserving the environment, um, acting as the guides or acting as the, the people who run the businesses. But in fact, all those financial benefits are being funneled out to uh, whoever the investors are, which oftentimes is, is, is first world um, uh, companies, um, organizations. And there's no exception um, to that in Costa Rica. Um, that certainly happens all the time. And so as I learned about that more, I decided that that's what I wanted to focus my project on. And so I was able to do um, uh, actually a quantitative analysis um, in contrast to a lot of these more qualitative projects, so a little, little different, um, uh, doing a survey, uh, doing uh, interviews um, with people in Quebrada now, which is a small town of 2,000 people in the Pacific Central region of Costa Rica, um, just north of Jaco and um, Anyway, really nice beaches. And it has a national park there, Carrara, um, which is uh, wonderful. And, the and you, you chose the site you wanted to stay in. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, yeah. I can tell you, did, yeah. <laughs> you know, rainforest beach, sure. I got the kind of both sides of it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and living there was absolutely wonderful. And the, the interviews that I did were really interesting to me. I found um, that from a quantitative standpoint, um, using a quality of life scale as a measure of social impact, there was no difference, um, there was no statistically significant difference between the quality of life of guides directly employed by the ecotourism industry and non-guides. Um, people who were oftentimes employed as teachers or um, administrators in schools, um, and I chose that group because uh, they were one of the few groups that I could identify that wasn't indirectly affected by ecotourism because it tends to be such a pervasive industry, it affects lots of different occupations in the region and not just direct employees, but indirect as well. And so um, a teacher is more likely to have kind of a, a, an outside perspective because their kids aren't going to come to school or not come to school based on whether they're tourists in the area. Sure. Um, and so there was no significant difference, and there are a couple of results that I want to share that kind of inform that finding a little bit. Um, number one is the, the, there was a significant difference in my sample um, of education. So. Um, guides were significantly less educated than non-guides. Mm -hmm. And Costa Rica is a country that places an unbelievable amount of value um, on, Educa uh, on education, of course, I'm sure you know. Um, and so you would maybe expect that there would be a difference in quality of life, in self-defined quality of life, based on um, the education level. But in this case, there wasn't. Um, and uh, I, you know, I don't pretend to know exactly why that is. But I think it's important to notice that there wasn't um, the kind of distinction and difference that you would expect to find just based on education. The second um, finding that I want to point to um, that kind of lends itself to um, some evidence for kind of an egalitarian relationship between people that are directly employed in, uh, in ecotourism and aren't um, is that if you take the group as a whole, uh, their income increases with their age across the board. Um, and I read that to mean that uh, uh, as regardless of your employment, as you age and as you advance in life, your career advances with you. You have more opportunities for income and your, your job changes and you're kind of more self-sustaining than, you know, when you're 42 than when you're 22. Um, I, I would have been at the top of the income. Yeah, no, there. you'd be way up there. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd own the company. You don't have the company, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so, and, and that was really important to me to show that, um, you know, both groups have an equal opportunity to kind of advance, um, and, and that, that pointed to some egalitarianism as well. Um, and so Costa Rica was, you know, is, is full of um, sustainable issues um, from a social pr perspective, from an environmental perspective, and an economic perspective. Um, and I was really glad to be able to do my research um, uh, focused on the social world and in the way that I did. Um, and while I think that my findings can't be um, maybe generalized even to the whole country, I think that they raise some interesting questions um, about how we can find a sustainable paradigm um, in the third world for sustainable development. Because I think that, um, you know, as we move into the future, um, sustainability is becoming more and more of an issue, environmental sustainability specifically, and uh, ecotourism is a perfect opportunity to, to kind of mesh conservation and preservation of the environment with the economic and social benefits that come along with having an industry in the region. Um, and so uh, I think that this project really raises those questions and addresses them, and I was really glad to be able to do it. So thank you.
Well, Costa Rica, as you know, is a sterling example of what democracy can do when uh, when a nation doesn't even have an army. Right. So they, their level of literacy is uh, approaching 100 percent. So the eco-tourist guides and also the teachers all were literate almost invariably in, in Costa Rica. I was able to go to Costa Rica with my family, just part of them, 21 of us. Uh, everybody, everybody went so, because I paid all the bills. Uh, and we were there at the turn of the century. We, we were there at, at 2000, when, when 1999 changed to 2000. And uh, I went to a party that night, and I wore spectacles with 2000 across. And I looked through the two zeros. I remember that. I won't, I won't tell you the rest of what happened at that party. <laughs> But, but all of us stayed at a, a, at a ranch uh, in the rainforest, forest in the mountainous area. And, and we were able to immerse ourselves in the ecotourism trade. And uh, Costa Rica has taken good advantage of it. And I think that uh, not only Costa Rica, but Panama and other countries in Central America, in fact, all over the large parts of this hemisphere and other, country, other continents as well, can capitalize on ecotourism in the future. It does two things. It brings in a lot of outside income and raises the standard of living of everybody, teachers and merchants and tech guides and all. But it also helps to preserve the, uh, the integrity of the environment because the government officials learn that this is a precious resource, economically speaking, to preserve. And, and the same thing would apply, say, to the game reserve areas in, uh, in Africa and other places. So what you've done is very good. It, and it, it shows that, uh, that there are advantages to everyone for ecotourism, right? And that the guides that work in ecotourism, although they're not as highly educated as some others, their income was equivalent. Absolutely. You didn't find any detectable difference between their income and the income of a, of a teacher or a merchant in that area, right? Actually, there was a difference, um, but uh, all, almost all of the uh, non-guides that I interviewed were older than the vast majority of the guides that I interviewed. Um, now, the older guides that I interviewed had absolutely comparable incomes to the older teachers and administrators that I interviewed. Yeah. So I, I, that's why I point to the shift. But at um, a given within. age level, there was no difference, right? Mm, yeah, I would say that's correct. I'm not yeah. trying to. No, no, I, I think that that's true, yeah. I didn't do the analysis on that, but no. from what I know, yeah, that's definitely true. Well, you have to go back two or three more times. Yeah, right? maybe I will, yeah. <laughs> you want to send me? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> that? That's very nice. Thank you for that. Hi, my name is Laura Withers. Um, yes. I'm a junior here in the college in the history department, and I spent last semester in Rwanda. Gabriel and I missed each other by a semester. Um, when I originally went to Rwanda, my intention was to look at government programs, whether they exist or not, and how effective they are related to children born out of genocidal rape after the 1994 genocide. Once I got into interviews and the policies of the government, I ascertained the importance of speaking to a number of the local NGOs in the area as well, and I'd like to talk a little bit about why. Um, there are very few actually stated policies related to these children, and when you speak to different people in different government offices, they will all give you different answers about how they relate to these children. One will say that these children are not considered victims at all. They weren't alive in April of 1994, and they don't offer them any kind of victim support. Others will say they don't get involved. They're worried about stigma. They just kind of oversee any NGO that decides to take the issue on, but they don't really have a direct. Um, mm -hmm. They're not directly involved with those children. And then third, you'll get government officials who say, oh yes, we consider these children victims, but as long as the mother was under 18 at the time of the assault, which really puts more emphasis on extremely vulnerable victims of rape than the children themselves. So it still kind of leaves a gap there. What I thought was interesting was the number of times that the government officials talked about the role of NGOs in addressing this issue. And so then I turned to looking at domestic NGOs, excuse me, NGOs. What was interesting about their response to my questions was the number of times they talked about the government officials sitting on their board of directors and the ways that they take their policy direction from the government and work closely with the government to so form policy. So the government policy. officials were on the board of directors of the NGOs? Yes. I see. Which is a conflict of interest, yeah. to say the least. Um, and so 
what you start to see is a disconnect because NGOs are taking their policy direction from, from the, government. the government, but the government is not placing any kind of emphasis on this. But at the same time, they're saying, well, we're just gonna let the NGOs handle it. The NGOs have no incentive to handle it because they're so closely allied with the government. And these children are kind of a microcosm of a larger issue in Rwanda, and that is that there are a number of people that don't fall into the stated categories that you find in the laws and that are not really receiving any kind of policy support. So Hutus who saved lives in 1994 might still be branded a killer. Or Hutus whose families were killed, Hutu women who were assaulted might still not receive the kind of survivor support that a Tutsi might receive. And there's this, I call them kind of gray area populations that don't really fall into any of the explicit categories in Rwanda. And my concern is that their needs and their demands are going to grow over the next 5, 10, 15 years and that it could lead to more violence in the future since inequalities and discrimination of this kind have done that historically in Rwanda. Were you in the capital? Yes. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. And did you deal almost exclusively with children who were born from a rape? I did not interview any children. I worked. But you dealt with their plight, right? Yes. I see. And, and does the government have any particular program that would uh, give special uh, assistance to a, a young person who was born from a forced rape? No. Do you think the government is treating them with e equanimity, with, with equality of, of consideration or not? Or do I, they feel discrimination from the government itself? My understanding is that they feel discrimination from the government itself. Ethnicity in Rwanda is very tricky. It's yeah, traced. I know. I, 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 okay. I've been there. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. And, and a lot of these children feel that they don't really fit in with anybody, their, their mother or their father. And they, they receive societal discrimination from other children and they don't really feel like they're receiving the services that they need from the government. And the mothers feel that way as well. A lot of the mothers speak to the NGOs about the resentments that they feel towards the government. They feel the government should be supporting their children. Was it more common for the uh, children who are product of a, of a forced rape to be still with their mothers or are they in institutions of some kind? The ones that we're sure of are still with their mothers. Still with their mothers. Um, still with their mothers, though they're now becoming older, 15, 16, 17, and starting to leave home. But there are certainly a greater number than we're aware of, but they were most likely abandoned at the end of the war by their mothers, or their mothers were killed, or, or something along those lines. And we can't really be sure as to their fate. Do you know if any of the mothers who were rape victims had been able to marry? It's a problem. Um, a number of them hide their status, and, yeah. and then if it gets revealed later, they can be rejected. Um, also, a number of them were given a choice by either family or mm -hmm. husbands to either abandon the child or be abandoned by the family. And, and admirably, in my opinion, a number of the mothers chose the child rather than the husband or the father. Mm -hmm. and it's very interesting to study those relationships and those bonds because it really is a love-hate relationship in a lot of ways between the mother and the child. And some of the stories are very inspiring. Well, I could ask all of you this question, but I wanted to ask you, how did you happen to choose that subject? Um, at the time that I crafted it, I was a women's studies and history double major, a women's studies and history double major, no. though I now drop the women's studies. But it came out of that, that kind of mentality of wanting to look at women's issues specifically. I'm also interested in international human rights law, and so I wanted to look at something related to law and government policy. Well, I think it's intriguing that, that a number of you have turned to a more of a sensitive human suffering question. You know, rape, rape victims and gays and lesbians in Mongolia and, 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 and others. Uh, it's very intriguing. And also a credit to all of you. Have, you, have, have any of you uh, any regrets about having chosen this effort? Would you, would, <laughs> would, you, would you recommend it for viewers of this? I understand we're making a film. Yes. Right? <laughs> right. Well, you'll become famous now since you're movie stars. And, uh, 
And so I think you probably will be approached by other students who say, how about me? How can I get in the program? Mm -hmm. And I hope it will be more widely available in the future because I think it uh, is, a, to repeat myself, which I'm inclined to do, uh, <laughs> I, I think that, that your contribution back to the Emory community, Emory University community, is also as important as what you've done for yourselves and for the people whom you, whom you visited for so long. And you, you learn, and the Carter Center has programs in more than 70 countries. And uh, we've found that those people are just as intelligent and hardworking and, and dedicated and ambitious as we are. And we tend to underestimate their quality as human beings. And, and, and so some of them are suffering, but we have people who suffer in our country who are, who are victims of, of rape or who are gays and lesbians or others who don't have equality of, of treatment from our own government. So I think that, that the basic human lessons that you learn are applicable uh, to any society. Thank you very much. Are there yes. any additional closing remarks you'd like to offer? Well, I think I've just pretty well said what I wanted to, but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions they might have. Or, or, or I don't know if, if you have comments or um, questions from the audience. I have two things I need to do before we close. And okay. I'll tell you Yes, I'll be meeting with them next. And I know, and I got a lecture about how <laughs> we better not run over, so I'll just apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a note of anyone, of students have a, a burning question they'd like to ask? There's a final question. Yeah. That's you, but if there's no time, I understand. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, moving into the future, and we've all done a lot of projects that. Um, really deal with some, some difficult issues. A lot of suffering, a lot of kind of human rights issues. Um, in my case, it's, it's more about um, sustainability uh, in general, but I mean, includes environmental sustainability, yeah. which is, as I mentioned, becoming kind of more and, you know, harder and harder to come by. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, as someone who's worked um, for such a long time uh, in these issues and, and dealing with um, kind of the most difficult issues that humanity faces, um, I'm sure you'd say the same thing. Uh, what, uh, what advice do you have for us to, to to keep us encouraged, to keep us moving on, um, and to, to not give up? Well, I, I think that you've got a very good start. That's, that's the first thing. I, I've noticed in my uh, long experience that, that the people that have been more successful in life have been, I would say, graduates of the Peace Corps, where my mother was a Peace Corps volunteer when she was 70 years old, and my oldest grandson was a Peace Corps volunteer. My mother was in India, my grand grandson was in South Africa. And a lot of the people who were in charge of the Carter Center programs, uh, in, when in democracy or, or in healthcare or in human rights or whatever, are graduates of the Peace Corps. And I think any young person in this, in this modern age of, uh, of difficulty in getting a job when you graduate, uh, that is also always a, uh, an opportunity that you shouldn't overlook. If you, have a, if you have a good job when you get out of college, go into your good job. And I think what you've done in, in Rwanda and in, and in Costa Rica and in Vietnam and so forth will pay rich dividends. But if you don't have a good job, consider the Peace Corps because that's a two year or two and a half year commitment. And, and almost invariably a, a major corporation like Coca-Cola or IBM or whatever, <clears throat> that's a, a very big plus mark on your, uh, on your history of, of past experiences. And uh, obviously in, in the fields that all of you have addressed in dealing with so societal problems and international e events, uh, a service in the Peace Corps will pay rich dividends. It's, it's, not a, it's not an absence in your life, it's not a setback, but it's a stepping stone above and beyond what you get at Emory if, if, you, if you need something to do like that. And, and I would say that even people like my mother was, she, mother was a registered nurse, she served in a, in a nursing home for six years, and she was a house mother at Auburn University, uh, and then she went into the Peace Corps. But it, it was a new dimension, a new way in her life to stretch her heart and to stretch her mind, to encompass more people, uh, and, it, and it really embellished her whole existence. And so I think what you've done is taken the first step toward that, no matter what your future might hold. But you've shown already a, an element of, uh, of adventurism and innovation and I think that uh, what you've done can be a lesson to any student, no matter what they're going to do in the future, 
to, to take a chance on, on new, new things, to go to different places, to, to, to have unanticipated, unpredictable experiences, and to explore new ideas of life. I think it has also already expanded your own life, and I think it can harbor great things for you in the future. So thank, thank you all you. for your great presentations. I'm proud of all of you for what you've done. wonderful uh, faculty who have been working with these students. We're very happy to have a couple of them with us today, Craig Hadley and Gordon Street. Um, they have advised multiple students who have done I, the idea of SEPA scholarship. So thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge and thank the families. Um, students couldn't do this without your support and encouragement, and that's great. And students, I'm so inspired. I can't wait to see what you do next. I know it's going to be wonderful. And President Carter, as always, thank you for your support of this program and for your personal interest in, in the students who are involved in it. Thank you. And I understand one of you knows one of our. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.